Hello, my name is Sven de Keizer. I am a neuroradiologist in Ghent University Hospital, and welcome to this video presentation on imaging of the paranasal sinuses. This is a presentation I did not make on my own. I got a lot of help from an excellent head and neck radiologist and a friend of mine, Dr. Simon Nicolai, who works at the University Hospital in Antwerp as a body and head and neck radiologist. So thanks a lot, Simon, because without his contribution, this presentation would not be the same. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about the anatomy of the paranasal sinuses, the general anatomy, and then I'm going to talk a lot about the various anatomic variants that you should know as radiologists, because they can either predispose to the development of sinusitis, or they might pose a surgical risk for the otolaryngologist who wants to perform a FES procedure in a patient with sinusitis. Future presentations will deal with imaging in sinusitis specifically, and also about will be about sinonasal polyposis and sinonasal tumors. This presentation will just focus on anatomy, and as you will see, there's a lot you can say about the anatomy of the paranasal sinuses. So let's get started with general anatomy. What are the paranasal sinuses? Well, the paranasal sinuses are a group of air-filled extensions of the nasal cavity that are located in the skull, in the frontal and sphenoid bone, or in the maxillofacial bony structures of the uh, maxillary bone and the ethmoid bone. So here we see the nasal cavity and we already see three groups of paranasal sinuses, the maxillary sinuses located in the maxillary bone, the frontal sinuses and the frontal bone, and the ethmoid sinuses located in the ethmoid bone. So we have four pairs of paranasal sinuses. We've already seen three of them on this figure and one that's missing are the sphenoid sinuses. Uh, this is what the nasal cavity looks like on an unenhanced CT uh, and bony kernel. So this is the nasal cavity and we see next to the nasal cavity a group of air filled structures and these are the paranasal sinuses. And we already see the maxillary sinuses over here in purple. We have here brownish the ethmoid sinuses and here on top we have the frontal sinuses. So still lacking are the sphenoid sinuses but we will see those on one of these images. So so once again, this is the nasal cavity located centrally within the maxillofacial bony structures. And we have here the frontal sinuses located in the frontal bone on top of the nasal cavity. Then we have the ethmoid cells, which are located on both sides of the superior aspect of the nasal cavity next, uh, next to the orbits. Here we have the maxillary sinuses located in the maxillary bone. And here at the back, we have the sphenoid sinuses. These are coronal and sagittal images. So let's also examine axial images and let's scrutinize those from bottom to top. So if we look at one of the lower slices, we have here the nasal cavity and next to it, we have the maxillary sinuses. Over here, we see the ethmoid sinuses next to the orbits. And at the back, we have the sphenoid sinuses located in the sphenoid bone. And here on top in the frontal bone, we have the two frontal sinuses. So the nasal cavity, let's now discuss the anatomy of the nasal cavity. Uh, the nasal cavity is bordered or divided in two parts by the nasal septum. And the nasal septum has a bony part and a cartilaginous part. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Then we have the heart palate, which forms the inferior surface of the nasal cavity. And the top is formed by the cribriform plate here centrally and over here, we have the so-called fovea etmoidalis bordering the superior aspect of the etmoid cells. Then we see that there are several um, shell-like structures located in the nasal cavity. These are the concha or the turbinates. So the lower one is the inferior nasal concha. And then we have the middle nasal concha and not visible on this image as the superior nasal concha. Uh, then we have here this bony structure, which is an extension of the ethmoid bone uh, and which divides the uh, olfactory fossa located over here, containing the bulbous olfactorius. So the olfactory 
olfactory nerve, and uh, two, so the olfactory fossa is divided in two by this structure called the cristagalli, which is um, a bony structure which can sometimes be pneumatized, but uh, often is not. Uh, this is the anatomy of the nasal cavity once more. So here we have the nasal septum dividing the nasal cavity in two parts, and we see there's a cartilaginous part here anteriorly and a bony part posteriorly. More about that in the next slide. And then we have an opening. We see an opening over here called the piriform aperture. This is basically the opening from the nose to the nasal cavity uh, and the part of the nose filled with air located on both sides of the nostrils is called the vestibule. So the piriform aperture is basically the opening from the vestibule of the nose to the proper nasal cavity. And then we also have a posterior border formed by the coana and the coana is basically the passageway from the nasal cavity, the inferior part, these are the inferior uh, turbinates of the nose or the inferior nasal turbinates um, to the nasopharynx located immediately posteriorly of it. So this is the anatomy of the nasal septum. So this is a mid-sagittal image. So we are located perfectly along the midline. So we're basically centered on the nasal septum. And we see that the nasal septum has a posterior part that is completely bony. And it has an anterior part that is soft tissue. This is basically cartilaginous. So the bony part consists of two components. We have the uh, upper part, which is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and then we have an inferior part which is called the vomer. Then we have here the quadrangular cartilage because it's a bit of quadrangular shaped as you can see and then on top of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone uh, we find the cribriform plate which is basically uh, a very small bony structure containing a lot of very small openings for nerves and blood vessels and that's why it is called cribriform because it contains a lot of uh, very small holes and this is basically the inferior surface of the olfactory fossa. Uh, then we have this bony extension on top of it. This is the cristagalli, which is basically some kind of um, uh, um, osseous structure located perpendicularly on top of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. And we have a very small canal called the foramen sacum located between the cristagalli and here the frontal bone containing the frontal sinuses. So it's basically located in the frontal ethmoid suture. And this is basically a primitive canal that used to be a connection between the nasal cavity and the intracranial compartment. And it can sometimes contain uh, con congenital uh, cystic lesion, lesions, such as dermoid cysts or epidermoid cysts, uh, or um, it can uh, form a kind of congenital sinus tract, a dermal sinus tract. But that's not important for this presentation. That's basically more for presentation on congenital anomalies of the skull base and maxillofacial structures. Then we have here at the lower part, the heart palate forming the inferior border border of the nasal cavity and we also have a very small canal located over here uh, on the midline which is the incisive canal. So this is mid-sagittal anatomy of the nasal cavity centered on the nasal septum. Let's now talk about the function of the nasal cavity. So here we have the nasal cavity. And what's the nasal cavity responsible for? Well, we can breathe two ways. We can breathe in through our mouth or which we most often do, we can breathe in through our nose. So basically we inhale air through our nose. And this air, well, basically goes through the nose to the nasopharynx and then gets in the trunk and the lungs and so on. So the nasal cavity plays an important function in the inhalation of air, not in the process of inhaling air, but what happens to the air. So it is lined by mucosa, which is a lot like the mucosa we find in the respiratory tract. And the purpose here of the nasal cavity is to humidify the inhaled air, to also heat the inhaled air, and also to filter out particles that are potentially uh, pathogenic 
pathogenic. So these are the main functions of the nasal cavity. You see that I removed the turbinates from this drawing, but those are normally present, of course. And what do they do? Well, they are also... Um, they also contain mucosa, and the mucosa on the turbinates is completely similar to the mucosa we find in the nasal cavity. And what the turbinates or the concha actually do is they increase the mucosal surface area. So they basically are responsible for narrowing the nasal cavity, forcing the inhaled air through very narrow passageways, which contain a lot of mucosa. So there's a very large mucosal surface here. So a lot of contact between air and mucosa for humidifying, heating, and filtering the inhaled air. Uh, this, this is a very nice depiction of the turbinates or the concha of the nasal cavity. So concha basically is the Latin word for shell because they're a bit shell-like shaped. As you can see, uh, I added some lines to make it more clear that they're a bit like shells uh, in shape, and they basically contain consist of a, sm a very small central bony uh, lamina, which is um, uh, covered with uh, mucosa that can be thick or can be thin, a bit depending on the time of the year and the specific situation. So we have basically three pairs of turbinates or concha. Uh, we have an inferior nasal concha, we have a middle nasal concha, and we have a superior nasal concha. And the location or the presence of this, these turbinates basically divides the lateral part of the nasal cavity in three passageways or meatus. Meatus is the Latin word for passageway, and the plural of meatus is also meatus. And what are these meatus or passageways? We have the inferior meatus located at the lateral aspect of the inferior nasal concha. We have the middle meatus located laterally of the middle nasal concha. And finally, we have the superior meatus located laterally of the superior nasal concha. And I've shown them to you uh, on this uh, coronal image, but we can also see them on the sagittal image. Here is the inferior meatus. Then here we have the middle meatus. And finally, we find over here the superior meatus. Notice that the superior nasal concha is uh, only is very small and only visible at a posterior coronal slice. It's located quite posteriorly. There can also be a supreme meatus, so a, for, um, a supreme concha or turbinate, but that's not always the case and tends to be extremely small. Uh, this is another drawing depicting uh, the nasal cavity. Um, I've added this picture to show you uh, the um, sites of attachment of the middle nasal concha. There are two important attachment sites for the middle nasal concha, and these are important anatomical reference points. So over here we see the crystal galli. This is the cribriform plate. We already know the cribriform plate by now, so it's basically the central part of the anterior skull base and forms the border of the olfactory fossa and we have one on both sides of the cristagali. Then here we have a very thin uh, bony structure. This is the vertical lamella connecting the middle turbinates to the inferior surface of the cribriform plate. And this is the lateral lamella which forms the lateral border of the olfactory fossa which can be considered some kind of continuous of the vertical lamella, or basically, well, they attach together or they meet. Then here in the coronal plane, we see another site of attachment of the middle turbinate. Here we have the lamina papyracea, the very thin bony border, medial bony border of the orbit, uh, located next to the ethmoid cells. And we see that the middle turbinate is attached to the lamina papyracea, and this attachment structure is called the basal lamella. So we have a vertical lamella connecting the middle turbinate to the cribriform plate and the lateral lamella. And then we have a basal lamella connecting the middle turbinate to the lamina papyracea or the medial orbital wall. Now, let's talk a bit more about the uh, meatus of the nasal 
uh, cavity. So we have three passageway or three meatus. Uh, what are these passageways for? So let's first uh, show you the uh, nasal turbinates once more. So we have the superior meatus, which is basically the passageway for uh, draining the sphenoid sinuses and the posterior ethmoid air cells. Then we have the middle meatus, which drains the maxillary and the frontal sinuses and the anterior ethmoid air cells. And lastly, we have the inferior meatus, which, which drains the nasolacrimal system. So this is basically the exit point for the nasolacrimal duct. I'm going to illustrate these various structures in more detail, but first let's talk about the function of the paranasal sinuses, because I'm going to talk about the passageways between the paranasal sinuses and the nasal cavity, but what do the paranasal sinuses do exactly? Why do do we have them? Why do we have these air filled extensions located on both sides of the nasal cavity? Well, there are several functions. A first one would be they reduce the relative weight of the skull because they do not contain bone, they do not contain much of anything. So they're basically just filled with air. So some people have a lot of air in their head, and we can uh, attribute that to having hyperpneumatized paranasal sinuses. Uh, they also um, add to the resonance of our voice, which explains why we sound strange and nasal when we have a rhinosinusitis. Uh, they also function as a trauma buffer for the maxillofacial skeleton, the so-called crumple zone. There aren't many critical structures located inside of them, so they basically buffer an impact to the maxillofacial structure or skeleton. And lastly, they have a function that is similar to that of the nasal cavity. They also contribute to heating and humidifying inhaled air and also to um, uh, filtering out uh, pathogens. Just like the nasal cavity, the paranasal sinuses are covered by mucosa, and this is a very thin layer, but it is there. We don't generally see it when it is normal and not thickened. When it is slightly thickened, we can actually see it, the mucosal layer. And this mucosal layer histologically consists of two major cell types. We have goblet cells, and goblet cells produce mucin. And then we have ciliated epithelial cells, and the cilia are responsible for uh, removing or propelling the mucin away from the sinuses. So what's the function here? Well, the, these contribute to heating and uh, humidifying inhaled air, but also to capturing pathogens, uh, dust particles, and so on. And because these cilia can move, the debris that is captured in the mucin layer is transported out of the paranasal sinuses. As we can see here when I'm showing you the arrows, that's what happens. So we inhale air, the air contains pathogens, debris, and so on. It is captured in the mucin covering the mucosal layer, and then by the movement of the cilia, is removed out of the sinuses into the nasal cavity through the passageways I'm now going to talk about. And we already see one over here. This is the maxillary sinus and this is the infundibulum. The infundibulum is the small passageway from the maxillary sinus to the middle meatus of the nasal cavity. But I'm going to discuss them systematically one by one. What are the drainage pathways of the paranasal sinuses? Well, we have two important ones. We have the sphenoid ethmoid recess, which is responsible for draining the sphenoid sinuses and the posterior ethmoid cells. And then we have the osteomyatal complex. So I already told you what the sphenoethmoid recess drains, sphenoid sinuses and posterior ethmoid. The osteomyatal complex is a complex. It consists of various components. We have the frontal recess, which is responsible for draining the frontal sinuses. We have the ethmoid bulla, which is responsible for draining the anterior ethmoid cells. And lastly, we have the infundibulum responsible for draining the maxillary sinuses. Let's discuss or illustrate the these passageways on imaging. 
And let's start with the sphenoethmoid recess. We can see the sphenoethmoid recess over here. I've uh, drawn some uh, arrows over here. It's basically a small connection connecting the sphenoid sinuses to the olfactory recess of the nasal cavity and they drain in the superior meatus, which is drawn over here on the sagittal image. We can also see the sphenoethmoid recess over here on the sagittal image. I'm going to remove the arrows once again, so you can see it for yourself without the arrows. And now here are the arrows, and here is the superior meatus. And what do they drain? Already told you, the sphenoid sinuses and the posterior ethmoid cells. Well, What's the difference between the posterior and anterior ethmoid cells? That's what the next slide is going to be about. Uh, well, roughly speaking, we can say whether, whether an ethmoid cell is anteriorly located or posteriorly, but can you actually say the, what's the border between the anterior ethmoid cells and the posterior ones? Yes, we can. Uh, there's an important anatomical reference point, and that is the basal lamella. So basically, the very thin bony structure connect, connecting the middle uh, turbinate with the lamina papyracea. And if we look on these images, here is the middle concha on an axial image, here it is on a sagittal image, and then we have this very small bony structure, which is the basal lamella of the middle turbinate, which connects the middle concha with the lamina papyracea, as you can see here. We can also see it on this sagittal image, uh, although its course is better seen on actual images, but I was able to capture one completely on a sagittal image as well. And then we get a division into the ethmoid air cells and the posterior uh, air cells. Also visible here on the sagittal image, this is the anterior compartment of the ethmoid cells, and here we have the posterior compartment. So the basal lamella of the middle concha basically divides the ethmoid cells into an anterior and a posterior compartment. Let's move on and talk about the frontal recess, which is the passageway between the frontal sinus and the middle meatus. So the middle meatus drains the maxillary frontal uh, sinuses and anterior ethmoid cells. And here we have, oops, that went too fast. Here we see the frontal sinus on a coronal image. And this is the frontal recess which drains into the middle meatus. And we can also see that on this sagittal image, here is the frontal sinus. Then we have here this connection uh, running through the middle meatus, although the middle meatus is located over here, but it, I was unable. So the middle turbinate is in the way, so we cannot see it on a sagittal image going completely into the middle meatus. And then we have an ethmoid air cell located anteriorly over here that is called an agornasi cell, but more about that later. That's an ethmoid air cell located anteriorly of the frontal recess. Let's move on to the ethmoid bulla. The ethmoid bulla drains the anterior ethmoid cells, and this is basically the largest, well, not necessarily the largest, but the most anterior ethmoid air cell located posteriorly of the frontal recess. So this is a pretty large ethmoid bulla. It's not always that large can also uh, be septated, so consisting of a group of smaller air cells, so you have a lot of variations in that regard, and the ethmoid bulla also drains in the middle meatus. Here we have the frontal recess, and as said, the ethmoid bulla, to be sure what the ethmoid bulla is, you best correlate with the sagittal image, is located posteriorly of the frontal recess, and the cell anteriorly of the frontal recess is the agernasi cell. So anterior ethmoid cells drain in the ethmoid bulla, and the ethmoid bulla drains in the superior meatus. Finally, the maxillary sinus gets drained by the infundibulum. This is the maxillary sinus. Then we have here this very small passageway, the infundibulum, which also drains in the middle meatus. So what all these passageways have in common, so the frontal recess, the ethmoid bulla, and the infundibulum is that they all drain in the middle meatus. And if we combine those, if we combine the frontal recess draining the frontal sinus, the ethmoid bulla draining the anterior ethmoid cells, and the infundibulum draining the maxillary sinus, if we combine those, we call this combination or this complex the osteomeatal 
complex. Uh, we've already seen the major structures of the osteomyoidal complex. There are some things I would still like to illustrate. Uh, let's magnify this a little bit. We see here the osteomyoidal complex on the right side. Uh, the point where the maxillary sinus actually enters the infundibulum is called the maxillary ostium. Then here we have the infundibulum, the very small passageway uh, to the middle meatus. And this point here, the end of the infundibulum, where basically everything meets, the ethmoid bulla, the frontal recess, and the infundibulum is called the hiatus semilunaris, semilunaris meaning half moon shaped. Um, and this then, oops, went too fast. This bony structure, which is located on uh, the middle maxillary wall and the attachment side of the inferior turbinate and which pro projects uh, supramedially is called the uncunate process. So it's basically the inferior uh, border of the infundibulum. And here we have the ethmoid bulla. And then one final drawing to illustrate all aspects of the osteomyoidal complex. This is the maxillary ostium. This is the infundibulum. Here we have the hiatus semilunaris or the semilunar hiatus. Here we have the frontal recess draining the frontal sinus, the ethmoid bulla. They all drain, all these combine and drain into the middle meatus. And finally, this very small bony structure over here as the uncinate process. So that concludes our discussion of the passageways. To make this discussion on general anatomy complete, let's also talk about the nasal lacrimal system. But very shortly, I mentioned that uh, the inferior meatus drains the nasal lacrimal system. So what do we have over here? This is basically the opening to the nasal lacrimal canal containing the nasal lacrimal sac. Then we have the nasal lacrimal canal located in the lacrimal bone over here containing the nasal lacrimal duct and finally this enters or opens in the inferior meatus which is shown on this image over here so i forgot to mention this but we go from top to bottom so this is a somewhat superior slice and this is a more inferior slice on coronal images we see the nasal lacrimal system over here sometimes it's filled with air but in this case it is not um, it has no significance if it's filled with air or seems to contain uh, probably fluid, uh, as we can see here. So we go from somewhat to the back to somewhat to the front. So this is the nasal lacrimal duct uh, located in the lacrimal bone, which opens anteriorly in the inferior meatus. So as illustrated by this arrow over here. Now, what are some other small structures I would like to show you? We have here a very small opening in the roof of the maxillary sinus or in the bottom of the orbit, the orbit floor, if you want. This is the infraorbital canal, which contains the infraorbital nerve, which is a nerve of the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve. And over here, we have something which is called the supraorbital notch. Sometimes it's a supraorbital canal. When there's a small opening on the inferior aspect, we call it a notch. When that's not the case, we call it a canal. Both are possible. And this contains the supraorbital nerve nerve, which is the branch, which is a branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. And those are sensory nerves supplying sensory innervation of the face. Then we have here some very small openings. And if you look at your sinus CTs, you will uh, almost always see those uh, located in the vicinity of the nasal bone and the lacrimal bone. And these are the anterior superior alveolar canals, which contain very small sensory trigeminal nerves, which supply, for instance, uh, the roots of the teeth and the maxillary bone. And located posteriorly, and it would be the first time that I have a resident uh, calling this a subtle fracture, uh, these are posterior superior alveolar canals, which also contain branches of the trigeminal nerve. So you often see those. Uh, you can often see those on multiple slices. And you see, if you scroll through your images, that these are actually very small canals. Do not mistake these for very subtle fractures. So very small openings of the anterior 
and posterior superior alveolar canals. Now, let's talk about the wide variety of anatomical variants that you can encounter in the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses, and there are a lot of them. I cannot show you all of them. A lot of them are also insignificant, so I'm going to focus on those that can be relevant. And what kind of variants are relevant? Well, if you have an anatomic variant that will narrow one of the passageways of the paranasal sinuses, like the osteomiatal complex, that can predispose to the development of sinusitis, uh, generally chronic sinusitis, and should definitely be reported, can also have an impact on the procedure if your otolaryngologist uh, wants to perform a FES procedure in the patient. And I'm also going to focus on anatomic variants that can pose a surgical risk if the patient were to undergo a FES procedure. I'm not going to divide them, I'm just going to discuss all these structures and I'm going to summarize them at the end. So when talking about a nasal cavity, what can we see? We can see septal deviation, we can see a thing called concabulosa, a paradoxical middle turbinate, and we also can see a lot of variation in the depth of the olfactory fossa. Let's start with septal deviation. Septal deviation is extremely frequent and depending on how you define it, well you can see it in like 90% of the population because as soon as as you consider a small deviation of one or two millimeters, a septal deviation, well, then you will see it in almost everyone. In some people, it can be more pronounced, like in these here, for example. We see here a septal deviation, a bit uh, reverse C-shaped to the left side, and also a very small bony spur located on the bony nasal septum, uh, which can be present, but is not always present. This is also a patient with a septal deviation and a small bony spur. And this is also something you can often see, especially in patients with a pronounced septal deviation, the turbinates are underdeveloped on the side to which the septal deviation is directed. So we have hypoplasia of the turbinates on that side. And in this patient, we see a septal deviation, which is a bit Oh, let's say reverse S-shaped to the right side. And we see that the patient has a bilateral concabulosa, more about that later. And we often see, well, the concabulosa is biggest on the left side and the septal deviation is mainly to the right side. And it's also an association that you will frequently see. A patient can have a concabulosa and then you will often have a septal deviation to the contralateral side of the concabulosa. So septal deviation is a very frequent finding depending on when you start calling it. If you start calling it as soon as you have a deviation of one or two millimeter, you will report it in almost everyone, I believe. It can be C or S-shaped or reverse C or reverse S-shaped, and you can have that shape in either the anteroposterior or the craniocaudal direction. Uh, it can be associated with bony spur, as we can see here. You can see underdevelopment or hypoplasia of the turbinates on the side of the deviation, and you can often have, but it's not always there, but you can often have a concabulosa or a paradoxical turbinate on the contralateral side, and then the deviation is to the side opposed to the presence of the concabulosa or the paradoxical turbinate. So this can be an incidental finding without any significance whatsoever, but because it also causes or can cause narrowing of uh, part of the nasal cavity, it can be associated with complaints of chronic airway obstruction. Um, so these are patients who sometimes present with a uh, feeling of stiffness. And uh, the question is, does the patient have a chronic sinusitis? Well, no sinusitis whatsoever, but a severe septal deviation causing narrowing of the nasal cavity. Uh, a septal defect is something you can also see. It's technically speaking not an anatomical variant. You are not born with a septal defect. There's always a cause, and that cause is in a lot of cases iatrogenic, the cause of surgery, a septoplasty, uh, although current methods are less prone to the development of a septal defect. They can also be caused by chronic nose picking, repeated cauterization therapies for nosebleeds. You can see them in uh, granulomatous diseases like sarcoid or Wegener disease, 
although we should now call that uh, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, no longer regular, my apologies. You can see it uh, as a side effect of chronic cocaine abuse or the chronic use of topical corticosteroids or decongestants and so on. Uh, when it comes to the shape of the turbinates or the conca, there is a lot of variation possible. They can be very thin, as we can see here. They can be quite thick, as we can see here. And they can be very asymmetrical, as we can see here. To add to that, the mucosa of the turbinates is richly vascularized and it can undergo a cycle of nasal uh, congestion and decongestion. So the size of the turbinates can vary in the course of the day. And it's possible that the most that uh, these turbinates will become thinner later in the day and these will become thicker. Of course, you generally don't do multiple CT scans of the sinuses on the same day. Why would you? Now, this is a, var uh, a variant you can frequently encounter as well, the concabulosa. The concabulosa is basically, um, how should I say it? You have like an air-filled cavity located centrally within the middle turbinate, just uh, as you can see here. And as you can see on this image, and as said, it's often associated with some septal deviation to the contralateral side. And also notice that this turbinate here is hypoplastic and underdeveloped, which you can also often see. Concabulosa is pneumatization of the middle turbinate. It's a frequent finding reported in 14 to over half of the general population, depending on when you start calling it, because, well, if there's a very small air filled cavity, some people will ignore it and others will uh, call it immediately. So I think it depends a bit on when you start calling it, how frequently you see it. It's often associated with septal deviation. And well, the significance, mostly it's not significant, but it can lead to some narrowing of the osteomyatal complex, especially when it is very large. Uh, then there are several types. Oops, my apologies. In this patient, we see that there is pneumatization of uh, the vertical lamella. This is called a lamellar concabulosa. And basically, this is not a true concabulosa. This is also something you can frequently see. This is so-called bullous concabulosa. We have pneumatization of the bulbous segment of the middle turbinates, and this is a true concabulosa. And then we have a last type. So here we have the lamellar concabulosa. So not true concabulosa. Here we have the pneumatization of the bulbous segment of the middle turbinate. And here we have an extensive concabulosa. Well, basically, this is pneumatization of the vertical lamella, this of the bulbous segment, and this of both of them. So both of the vertical lamella and of the bulbous segment. Uh, then this is an example of a paradoxical middle turbinate. So normally, our turbinates make a turn, turbinate, turn. There's no relation uh, etymologically, but uh, it's a way to uh, remember it. And normally, we see that the point of convexity is centered towards the nasal septum, as illustrated here at the level of the inferior turbinate. However, in this patient, the uh, convexity of the middle turbinate is centered to the lateral side, and this is a paradoxical middle turbinate, also visible here in another patient. So a paradoxical middle turbinate, illustrated once here, is basically an inferomedially curved mid-middle turbinate edge. Uh, so it's uh, we have a curve that goes to the bottom and then uh, medially, so the point of maximal convexity is laterally. It's usually bilateral, it's not that frequent, about 10% max, and once again, mostly insignificant, but it can be associated with some narrowing of the osteomyatal complex. Then finally, the olfactory fossa. The olfactory fossa contains the bulbous olfactorius, as said already, and it is bordered inferiorly by the lamina cribrosa. Then this is the inferior part of the olfactory fossa. Then the bony border of the etmoid air cells located next to the olfactory fossa is the fovea etmoidalis. And then we have a very thin bony structure, and it's one of the thinnest bony structures of the nasal cavity, that is the lateral lamella. And 
centrally here, dividing the hole in two as the Crista Galli. And it's important to evaluate the depth of the olfactory fossa, defined as the vertical distance between the lamina cribrosa and the fovea at moidalis, because how deeper the olfactory fossa is, how higher the risk of perioperative injury to the lateral lamella during a FES procedure. And how do you measure that exactly? Well, you can just measure it in millimeters, but that is a classification system that's very useful. And that's the Kiros classification. Uh, it's existed for quite a while. I believe it's as old as uh, was introduced in 1941, but I can't be mistaken. So don't uh, take me on that. Uh, this is a Kiros type one, which is an olfactory fossa measuring or only being one to three millimeters deep. Keros type 2 is 4 to 7 millimeters deep, and a Keros type 3 is more than 8, 8 millimeter or deeper. So that should be mo uh, more or equal to 8 millimeters. Uh, Keros type 2 is the most frequent, Keros type 1 is the second most frequent, and Keros type 3 is the least frequent but has the highest risk of injury to the lateral lamella during a FES procedure. And why is that? Because in a FES procedure, sometimes the turbinates are removed, a procedure called conchectomy. And as said, the lateral lamella is the weakest bony structure of the nasal cavity. And by removing them, traction is exerted on the lateral lamella and it might break. And then we get direct exposure of the intracranial compartment to the nasal cavity, which can lead to, for instance, um, how do you call that in English? Uh, a CSF leak, a leak of cerebrospinal fluid into the nasal cavity. Uh, what is also important is to evaluate potential asymmetry of the olfactory fossa. For, and for instance, in this patient, we'd say that this olfactory fossa is very undeep, a scleros type 1, and the other one is deep, that's the scleros type 3. However, this is the most vulnerable one. Why is that? Because look at the orientation of the fovea et poidalis. It's very asymmetrical, and that is something you should also take into account when evaluating the olfactory fossa. A normal olfactory fossa or a normal fovea et poidalis is quite horizontally orientated and is located above the upper one third of the orbit. Uh, here, this fovea et moidalis is at risk. It has a vertical or diagonal slope, and it is located under the upper one-third margin of the orbit. Also notice that this um, olfactory fossa is located deeper than this one. So in this particular situation, basically most at risk is the lateral lamella of the right side, although if you were to use the Keros classification, it is just a Keros type 1, and that is due to the vertical or diagonal orientation of the foveal uh, etmo, etmoidal fovea. Uh, let's now talk about variations in the sphenoid sinuses. I'm going to talk about the general pneumatization pattern, uh, how extensive pneumatization is of the sphenoid sinuses, which can be quite variable. And because the sphenoid sinuses are located in the sphenoid bone and a lot of critical structures go through the sphenoid bone, the variability and pneumatization of this skull-based sinus can also uh, lead to exposure of certain critical structures such as the optic nerve or the carotid canal. And this is important information to give to your otolaryngologist when he's going to perform or she is going to perform a FES procedure. And lastly, we should also evaluate where the septum of the sphenoid sinus inserts. So let's go uh, over this one by one. Let's talk with a general um, evaluation of pneumatization of the sphenoid sinuses, and this is best done in the sagittal plane. Uh, there's a classification for that, and this would be a conchal type of sphenoidal sinus pneumatization, which means that the sphenoid sinus is under pneumatized, and there's a lot of bone between the very small sphenoid sinus and the cella tursica, as you can see here. This is the pre-cellar type of sinus, uh, sphenoid sinus pneumatization, and in this case, the pneumatization extends to and beyond the anterior margin of the cella tursica. And finally, we have the cellar type of sphenoid pneumatization. And in this case, pneumatization extends posteriorly of the cella tursica all the way 
to the clivus so that basically there's also a very thin bony margin between the sphenoid sinus and the intracranial compartment and this last situation is the most dangerous one because there's a risk of inadvertent perforation of the posterior sphenoid sinus during a fest procedure exposing the sinus content to the intracranial compartment and we do not want that now, sphenoid uh, pneumatization can be evaluated in the sagittal plane, but should definitely also be examined in the axial and coronal planes. And there's a wide variability on the extent of uh, sphenoid sinus pneumatization. Here it is quite limited, as you can see, and here it is very extensive. Uh, this is probably going to be a cellar type sphenoid pneumatization. This is the very thin margin of the clivus, and we see that pneumatization extends in both sphenoid wings. So uh, the skull-based pneumatization of the sphenoid sinuses can be quite variable. You can have involvement of the sphenoid wing, of the anterior clinoid process or the pterygoid process, and that's mainly important because it can be associated with protrusion or the hissance of the optic canal, the carotid canal, and the vidian canal. This is probably a lot of information on one slide. Let's illustrate all these uh, things with some images. It will make everything more clear. This is a magnified coronal image of the sphenoid sinuses. And on this image, we see all the important neurovascular structures which are located around the sphenoid sinus. What are those? This over here is the vidian canal containing the vidian nerve. And over here, we have the foramen rotundum containing the maxillary nerve or the second branch of the trigeminal nerve. Over here, located along the anterior clinoid process we find the optic nerve and located underneath and to the back of the anterior clinoid process we find the canal for the uh, inferior carotid artery so these are all very important structures let's now talk about the bony anatomy of the sphenoid sinus we have the sphenoid plate which is the roof of the sphenoid sinus over here we have what is called the rostrum so we have a small beak extending in the floor of the sphenoid sinuses extending into the nasal septum and in some cases we can have pneumatization of the nasal septum uh, contiguous with the sphenoid sinuses but that's not that important then this is the anterior clinoid process and we have the optic nerve running in front and above the anterior clinoid process and the internal carotid artery uh, running uh, inferiorly and to the back of the anterior clinoid process Process. Then we have here the pterygoid process containing a medial plate and a lateral plate. And for the sake of completeness, here is a small septum dividing the sphenoid sinuses in two parts, the so-called intersinus septum. And lastly, we also have the same structures, of course, on the contralateral side, the same neurovascular structures. So uh, the Vidian canal is located over here. And especially in patients with uh, a cellular type pneumatization, you can see protrusion, which basically means uh, that the canal for the Vidian nerve is located at least partially in the uh, sphenoid sinus, that's a protrusion, or the hissance, meaning that the bony covering of the canal is missing and there is direct, direct exposure of the nerve to the sinus content. Uh, very often there's a very small thin bony lamella surrounding the nerve, as we can see here, and also probably present over here, but we see that there is clear protrusion, and that is something you can often see. Uh, you can report it, it will make sure that the otolaryngologist is very careful, but uh, you see it in a lot of cases in my experience, especially when there's also pneumatization of the pterygoid process, as we can see in both these patients. More important, I believe, is protrusion or the hissance of the carotid canal and the optic nerve. In this patient, we see these are coronal images. This is a coronal image. This is an axial image. We see there is pneumatization of the pterygoid process on both sides, but also of the left. Oh, this should be the left. My apologies. The left anterior clinoid process. And as said, the optic nerve runs in front and on top of the anterior clinoid process. So the optic nerve, which 
can still be covered by a bony uh, canal will run at least partially through the sphenoid sinus and i've drawn that on these images for you so you should alert your otolaryngologist and you can see that more clearly if you're able to scroll through the images so that should definitely be in your report and what is seen also in this patient is we have some protrusion over here and there's no bony lamella visible, maybe faintly, but I doubt it. So this is probably a protrusion at a distance of the right internal carotid artery. And we can also see that very clearly over here. So that should also definitely be in your report that it is direct exposure of the right internal carotid artery and the right sphenoid sinus. Then the uh, sphenoid sinuses, especially when they are extensively pneumatized, can contain several accessory septa. Uh, this is the canal for the internal carotid artery, so it's located more at the back of the sphenoid sinuses. Uh, and we see here that there's an intersinus septum, uh, which connects directly to the canal for the internal carotid artery. And that's important because if your surgeon, for instance, not, not necessarily in fest surgery, but uh, if a patient has a macroadenoma, it generally resected through a transsphenoidal transphenoidal approach in which the neurosurgeon will remove the septa which are in the way. However, if a septum connects to the internal carotid artery, you have to remove it very carefully. By uh, exerting a lot of traction, you're at the risk of damaging the canal for the internal carotid artery and damaging the wall of the internal carotid artery. You don't want that. The same is true for this accessory septum, so you, so you should always report that if you see these septa contacting the canal for the internal carotid artery as is the case here for the intersinus septum, but not for this accessory septum. What do we also see? We see that there is some protrusion of the left internal carotid artery and the bony lamella uh, seems tint, definitely compared to the other side. I think it's still present, but it is uh, thinner compared to that side. Here we have an accessory septum uh, connected to the canal for the internal carotid artery on the left side. And here we have a clear protrusion with thinning of the bony wall of the right internal carotid artery canal. Now let's talk about variability in the ethmoid cells. Although variability, two of those are basically normal, the ethmoid bulla and the Ajornasi cells. And then we have some cells that are present in part of the population, but not in everyone, and can have an impact on FEST procedures like the Haller cells, the supraorbital cells, and the Onodi cells. And lastly, we will talk about the anatomy of the Lamina papyracea, and variants that should be reported uh, to the otolaryngologist. What's the ethmoid bulla? Well, we already talked about it, so I'm going to be brief. It's basically the largest and the most consistent anterior ethmoid air cell located dorsally of the frontal recess, and it drains into the osteomyatal complex, and it is located medially of the lamina apparacea. This sagittal image shows us the frontal recess, and we see here the ethmoid bulla located posteriorly of the frontal recess. Oops, my apologies. This image shows us the ethmoid bulla, which is located immediately posteriorly of the frontal recess. And then over here on the coronal images, we see these very large ethmoid bullas. Notice that these can be a lot smaller. I'm sure I've uh, selected this example because they're so large and are, as a consequence, very uh, exemplary. But you have a lot of variability there, can be septated, can be a group of smaller cells which together form an ethmoid bulla. So a lot of variability there. So let these images not deceive you. It's not always, they are not always this big. Then we have the Ajarnasi cell, which is phys uh, present in about 90% of the population, and which is basically uh, an air cell located uh, anteriorly in the ethmoid, uh, anteriorly of the frontal recess. 
uh, and it's located in the lacrimal bone. And you have a lot of variability when it comes to adrenalzy cells as well. And these variants can sometimes narrow the frontal recess and can become relevant in a patient with a chronic frontal sinusitis. And you have a lot of classification systems for that, and that can be a bit confusing. I'm only going to illustrate some of the variants you can see, and uh, which are given by the so-called Kuhn classification. So this is a typical adrenalzy cell, except that it's quite big and extends a bit into the frontal sinus, but well, not that much. I'm going to call it a typical adrenalzy cell, although a bit big. Then this is an adrenalzy cell, and there's another cell located on top of it. This would be a type 1 frontal recess cell, according to the Kuhn classification. In this patient, we have here an adrenalzy cell and two air cells located on top of it in front of the frontal recess. This would be a type 2 frontal recess cell, according to the Kuhn classification. And here we see a very large cell extending uh, into the frontal sinus, but not extending above half of the height of the frontal sinus. This would be a type 3 Kuhn cell. And then a type 4 is basically the same but extending and over 50% of the height of the frontal sinus. I do not use that classification uh, a lot. Uh, I think it's only relevant in a patient with a frontal sinusitis to see if there are uh, predisposing factors for narrowing of the frontal recess, but you have a lot of variability there. So these classifications can sometimes be uh, handy to uh, facilitate communication of complex findings. Then we have the Heller cells. These are not infrequent, but as you can see, the reported variability, uh, the reported prevalence varies incredibly. So that probably depends on when people start calling it from two to 42%. And these are basically ethmoid air cells located along the medial wall and the floor, especially the floor medially of the orbits. So in this case, they are pretty big. They can be a lot smaller and they can narrow the osteomyatal complex. In this patient, that's not the case, but you can imagine it can cause narrowing of the osteomyatal complex due to their location. And they also pose a surgical risk. And why is that? Because your otolaryngologist doesn't see that these cells are contacting the orbital floor. And when he is a bit uh, uncareful, might cause an inadvertent perforation of the medial or inferior wall of the orbit, uh, which uh, then the potential for an orbital hematoma or other complications. Then this variant is very important. These are so-called supraorbital air cells. They are not infrequent, seen in about one third of the general population, and they are anterior ethmoid air cells extending above uh, the orbital roof, as you can see here. And you shouldn't confuse them with the frontal sinuses. They're generally located uh, inferiorly and posteriorly of the frontal sinuses. And why are those important? Because they are located above the entry point for the anterior ethmoidal artery. And that's important. I'm going to show you why or explain you why. First of all, you have to identify the notch for the anterior ethmoidal artery. Uh, this is basically... Uh, uh, a point that's a bit triangular shaped can be found in the superomedial aspect of the orbit next to the ethmoid air cells, and it contains the foramen for the entry of the anterior ethmoidal artery to the skull base. So, what is the anterior ethmoidal artery? It's basically a branch of the ophthalmic artery which will supply. Um, a large part of the nasal cavity, the turbinates, uh, and so on. And normally, it, it uh, goes from the orbit to the skull base to a foramen located in the ethmoidal notch. So this is the anterior ethmoidal notch. Then we have here the anterior ethmoidal artery, and it basically runs in the skull base and then penetrates the cribriform plate once again. As I said, it contains a lot of small openings to uh, supply the nasal septum, the turbinates, and so on, the nasal cavity. What happens in a patient with uh, supraorbital air cells? Well, we're not there yet. Here's another example, very nice, uh, from Elsevier. This is the ophthalmic artery. 
Uh, this is an uh, actual image. This is the anterior ethmoidal artery. And we see that it basically pierces the skull base, then runs on top of the cribriform plate, and then very small branches penetrate the cribriform plate to supply the nasal cavity. So you have to understand that anatomy to understand why supraorbital air cells are important. And here I angled these images a bit. We basically see the foramen for the anterior ethmoidal artery. And we see that this canal runs to the skull base and this would be the olfactory fossa containing the olfactory bulbs. Uh, so why is it important? Well, this is a safe situation. This is a covered anterior ethmoidal notch. We immediately see the fovea ethmoidalis on top of the anterior ethmoidal notch. So basically the artery never runs in the ethmoidal air cells, immediately pierces the skull base and um, enters the olfactory fossa. In this patient, however, the ethmoidal notch is located underneath ethmoidal air cells, which means that the artery has to run uh, through the ethmoidal air cells to enter the skull base. And this is a um, potentially a uh, dangerous situation because if your otolaryngologist performs an ethmoidectomy, he might inadvertently uh, lacerate the anterior ethmoidal artery. And then this will, uh, the transected anterior ethmoidal artery uh, will basically, how do you say that in English? Um, collapse, no, retract, retract into the orbit, and there it can cause a hemorrhage. It can cause uh, a muscle hemorrhage or an orbital hemorrhage, and these are dangerous because these are arterial hemorrhages. They will expand rapidly, and they can cause an orbital compartment syndrome, uh, potentially leading to vision loss. So a very dangerous situation, and that's why supraorbital ethmoidal air cells definitely have to be reported if a patient is about to undergo a FES procedure. Then another variant, let's look at a coronal image. What do we see here? Well, let's start easy. This is the left sphenoid sinus. Then this is the right sphenoid sinus. And we have here some kind of lamella or septum and an additional air filled structure on top of the right sphenoid sinus. And this is a so-called onodi cell. And an onodi cell, is not part of the sphenoid sinuses. No, this is basically, this is the left sphenoid sinus. This is basically a posterior ethmoid air cell which extends on top of the sphenoid sinus. And to be 100% sure, you would have to look at your sphenoethmoidal recess because the sphenoid sinuses will have an opening, the sphenoethmoidal recess, which the onodi cell will not have. I'm not showing you these images, but that's something you have to do to be 100% completely sure that you're dealing with an onodi cell. And why are onodi cells important? Well, because the optic canal often runs next to an onodi cell and your neurosurgeon probably doesn't know that when he's performing a FES procedure or your uh, otolaryngologist doesn't know uh, that when he's performing a FES procedure. He believes that he's in the ethmoid cells. Normally, the ethmoid cells do not contact the optic canal, so he can be maybe a bit less careful than if he would have known that he's working in an ethmoid air cell next to the optic canal. So if you mention the presence of an anodi cell, the neurosurgeon will know, or the otolaryngologist, that the most posterior ethmoid air cell is probably located in the vicinity of the optic canal and be extremely careful when working over there. And here we have the optic canal on the coronal image. So onodi cells uh, or variant posterior ethmoid air cells located superiorly and laterally of the sphenoid sinus, like shown over here, but identify the sphenoethmoid recess to be 100% sure what you're dealing with. They might extend into the anterior clinoid process. is not the case here, but they often do. And you know that there's a close relationship between the optic nerve and the anterior clinoid process. So the optic nerve will generally course in or next to an onodi cell with a risk of perforation during a posterior ethmoidectomy if your otolaryngologist is not aware of that. This is a nice example of a pneumatized uh, anterior clinoid process on both sides, 
On this side, it is caused by an anode cell. On this side, it is basically caused by the left sphenoid sinus. And over here, we have the right sphenoid sinus. Let's magnify it a bit. And then we see that there is clear protrusion of the optic nerve on both sides. Over here, it seems that there's maybe a flimsy, flimsy bony covering, but that definitely can no longer be recognized here. So this is a pure dehiscence of the right optic nerve and to the onodi cell. And here we have protrusion and possible dehiscence of the left optic nerve and to the left sphenoid sinus. And on top of that, we also have some protrusion basically on both sides sides with thinning of the bone and maybe absent bony covering on both sides of the carotid canal. So it should definitely go in your report. We're almost through. A final structure to examine is the lamina paparacea, which is the medial orbital wall or the lateral wall of the ethmoid cells. This is the lamina paparacea. It looks completely intact on the left side, but on the right side, we have a defect and this defect is filled with orbital fat. This can be congenital or can be the result of an old trauma and should also definitely be reported. So your otolaryngologist will not inadvertently penetrate the orbit during a FES procedure. A final thing you should definitely mention is the presence of a so-called adherent uncanate process. What is that? Well, it's basically an uncanate process that seems like it's glued to the medial inferior orbital floor or wall. And this might be associated with the silent sinus syndrome because we get a chronic occlusion of the maxillary sinus leading to under pressure and the development of sinus atelectasis, so-called silent sinus syndrome. And we get bowing of the walls of the maxillary sinus uh, inwards, which can also cause an enophthalmus uh, due to downward displacement of the orbital floor on the involved side. So that's one thing. It's associated with the development of a silent sinus syndrome, but when a FES procedure is performed, an aggressive unconnectomy, so an aggressive removal of the unconate process might lead to damage of the medial inferior orbital wall, as you can see here. And this is a normal process, unconate, uh, unconate process for comparison. So I think we are true when it comes to discussing the anatomy of the paranasal sinuses. It was quite long. Let's try to summarize it. What's most important? Well, of all the structures I talked about uh, anatomically, uh, most important are the passageways from the paranasal sinuses into the nasal cavity, the sphenoethmoid recess and the osteomiatal complex. We talked about them in great detail. Here is the sphenoethmoid recess draining the sphenoid sinuses and the posterior ethmoid cells. And here we have the various structures of the osteomiatal complex. What should you definitely report and your discussion of anatomy of the paranasal sinuses, you should know those variants that might narrow the sinonasal outflow tracts or might be associated with surgical risk risks if a sinonasal procedure is to be performed, such as a FES. Uh, what are those? Well, these are some variants that might be associated with narrowing of the osteomiatal complex. Here we have septal deviation with a septal spur. Here we have concabulosa. In this patient, we see the presence of Haller cells. This is a paradoxical concha media or paradoxical middle turbinate. And over here, we have frontal recess cells, which might lead to narrowing of the frontal recess uh, and not the entire osteomiatal complex. Then we should know variants that uh, might be associated with surgical risks, and these are given by the acronym CLOSE. Cribriform plate should be evaluated, lamina paparacea, presence of onodi cells, sphenoid sinus plumatization, and the ethmoidal notch. When it comes to the cribriform plate, use the Keros classification and how deeper the olfactory fossa, how higher the risk is for damage to the lateral lamella during a FES procedure, and also evaluate asymmetrical um, olfactory fossa. When it comes to the lamina paparacea, check for integrity. Is there a defect? Is there orbital fat prolapse into an ethmoid cell or not? Check for the presence of Haller cells located inferiorly along the medial orbital wall and for the presence of an adherent uncanate process. 
On all these cells are important to mention because uh, when a posterior ethmoidectomy is performed, the, neuro the otolaryngologist has to be aware that the optic nerve runs uh, in the neighborhood and might even be dehiscent, so located inside the posterior ethmoid cell or the anode cell. Sphenoid sinus plumatization should be performed. Use the classification of conchal, precellar, and cellar to already give an idea uh, on the degree of pneumatization and evaluate on the presence of protrusion of the hissens of the optic nerve and the carotid canal and also look where the sinus septum or accessory septa insert, especially if they insert on the carotid canal, this needs to be mentioned. And finally, evaluate the location of the etmo etmoidal artery notch and look for the presence of supraorbital etmoid air cells. And I've illustrated these, and that will be my final slide, I believe. Evaluate the cribriform plate, evaluate olfactory depth and the presence of an asymmetrical uh, olfactory fossa. Evaluate the lamina papyracea. Is it intact, or is there protrusion of orbital fat into the ethmoid cells, or there are haller cells, or do we deal with an adherent uncinate process? Evaluate. Uh, or exclude the presence of an anode cell. And if an anode cell is present, definitely look for possible dehiscence of the optic nerve or the internal carotid artery, as is present in this patient, as you can see. Then evaluate the sphenoid sinuses, uh, estimate the degree of pneumatization, and especially the cellar type is associated with a risk of a perforation into the intracranial compartment because there's only a very small bony wall separating the sphenoid sinus from the intracranial structures and look for the distance of the internal carotid artery or optic nerve and the sites of insertion of the intersinus septum or accessory septa. Finally, evaluate the presence of the anterior ethmoidal notch and is it bordered by the fovea ethmoidalis or by supraorbital air cells. That concludes my presentation on sinus anatomy. This is an excellent article which gave me a lot of inspiration and which I uh, used a lot during uh, this presentation, the preoperative sinus CT, avoiding a close call with surgical complications. I can uh, recommend it to everyone, as well as these excellent review articles. So uh, if you want to know more, definitely check them out. I want to thank once more my good friend and colleague, Dr. Simon Nikolai of the Antwerp University Hospital for uh, inspiring me uh, to make this presentation presentation because he made a similar presentation in the past which influenced me a lot and I learned a lot from him and uh, he agreed that I used his presentation to make this one so thanks a lot Simon and uh, coming soon imaging and sinusitis sinonasal polyposis and sinonasal tumors so stay tuned if you have any questions comments or feedback you can leave a comment question or feedback in the comment section or you can send me an email neuroradiology.online at gmail.com and you can even send an email to the true expert dr simon nicolai simon nicolai at usa.be thank you very much for watching and as my young son tells me to tell you like and subscribe Thank you very much.